right. Wow. I see I'm preaching to the right side of the auditorium <laughs> this morning. Well, good morning, everybody. Today brings us to a very exciting lesson on the Song of Solomon. I know some of you are, are very excited about this morning. So if you would turn in your Bibles to Song of Solomon, we're going to look at chapter 8 as we get started this morning. Song of Solomon chapter 8 and verse 6 and 7. Now these surveys have brought us to the very end of the Old Testament books of poetry and wisdom. Next week we're going to be starting a new section called the Prophets. But let's look at an introduction here in chapter 8 and verses 6 through 7. It says, Set me as a seal upon thine heart, as a seal upon thine arm. For love is strong as death, jealousy is cruel as the grave. The coals thereof are coals of fire, which hath a most vehement flame. Many waters cannot quench love, neither can the floods drown it. If a man would give all the substance of his house for love, it would utterly be condemned. I titled this lesson, The Joy of True Love, because it is godly love that is the central theme of this entire book. Here in Solomon's Song, we discover a perspective that is unlike any other contained in the Bible. But even though the form is unique, similarities still abound. There are many other scriptures that teach us all about the subject of love. One such passage is found in 1 Corinthians. And even though the familiar words of chapter 13 are frequently taken out of context, there is no argument with the force and scope of Paul's New Testament description of love. What's brought to the forefront by the text that we just read is the almost inexpressible might of true biblical love. It is so strong that the author compares its power to the finality of physical death or to a raging fire that cannot be extinguished. He goes on to say that love is also not something that can be purchased. It's beyond the reach of money or artificial influence. By revealing love in this way, the scripture steers men away from the foolishness of human thoughts and feelings to a higher standard that exists beyond us. Now, as I was starting to put this lesson together, I thought it might be interesting to type the words, what is love, into Google to see what the top search results would be. This little phrase generated an impressive 19 million or so hits. Unfortunately, the top three articles all failed to answer my question, instead changing it into something different like, what is the true meaning of love? Is there true love? Or what does love mean? There's no doubt this world has some very warped ideas about the subject of love. For all of the supposed wisdom, understanding, and scientific progress that men choose to place their faith in, about the best that our dictionaries can come up with is that love might be something like an intense feeling of deep affection, a great interest, or just liking another adult very much. Those are all quotes from online dictionaries. The problem is, is that people really aren't settled on what it is. Famous philosophers and other popular figures have tried to define it, often coming up with some questionable results. These secular opinions can range from totally depressing, as in the case of Orson Welles. He said, we're born alone, we live alone, we die alone. Only through our love and friendship can we create the illusion for a moment that we're not alone. To the merely sad, there is hardly any activity any enterprise which has started out with such tremendous hopes and expectations and yet which fails so regularly as love. To the humorous, love is temporary insanity, curable by marriage. To the utterly foolish, what is love? Oh baby, don't hurt me, don't hurt me, no more. <laughs> to the world, love seems to be this indefinable, ethereal thing that randomly leaps onto people bringing them unimaginable happiness or, in many times, unspeakable pain and suffering. According to our culture, love is almost totally unpredictable, and it's completely subjective. Good thing, then, that believers have the preserved word of God to bring some clarity into this mess of high emotion and human reason. Who better to define love for us biblically than the Apostle John, referred to as the disciple whom Jesus loved numerous times in the scriptures? He wrote in his first epistle, Beloved, let us love one another, for love is of God, and every one that loveth is born of God and knoweth God. Verse 16 of the same chapter says, And we have known and believed that love, the love that God hath to us, God is love, and he that dwelleth in love dwelleth in God, and God in him. What is love? God is love. Who loves? Those that are born of God. First John teaches us that one of the reasons 
that there is so much confusion about love is because unbelievers and unconverted people cannot really love. Love is of God. So, of course, he gets to define what it means. If a person is not dwelling in God and God in him, he can't really love. To love, someone must first be born of God and know God. This fact really needs to be pointed out as we begin to consider a book that's all about the subject of love. If people have rejected the gospel and Christianity, then they don't get to keep stealing from it. They don't get to pretend that what they are practicing is genuine. God's love is not vague or subjective or confusing. If men are not of God, then they do not love. People might practice some kind of transactional relationship. They might express powerful feelings that they call love, but it isn't really love by God's definition. Love belongs with God and with the Bible and not with unbelievers, even if they insist that they are the most caring people on the planet. Human sentiment and affection will never reach the level of godly love. These two things fail to provide the greatest and most essential need that every person has to be placed into a right relationship with God and to walk in close fellowship with him. Romans 5.8 says, But God commendeth his love toward us, in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. In stark contrast to the Lord's embodiment of genuine love, the world's ideal rises no higher than to provide another person with some fleeting physical and emotional pleasure during this life. These kinds of temporal commitments are ultimately useless because they will inevitably end in eternal torment for everyone involved. The highest value placed on man's ideas about love is still just human. It's not divine, and because of that, it will always be vain and superficial. So as we make our way through this lesson, don't forget that every facet of what is revealed and discussed in this book depends, first and foremost, upon an individual's relationship and fellowship with God. Have you indeed been born of God? Then this book is for you. If not, then you cannot hope to understand or practice the godly love that is celebrated in these pages. Now the full title for the book before us today is The Song of Songs, which is Solomon's. The word song at the beginning is a common Hebrew term for any kind of happy melody. The expression Song of Songs means the greatest of all songs, just like the phrase King of Kings means the greatest king. It prepares us for a single song of outstanding quality. Though some critics reject King Solomon as the author and think that the first verse means which is about Solomon, the internal evidence supports the belief that Solomon authored this book. 1 Kings 4.32 tells us that Solomon spake 3,000 proverbs and his songs were 1,005. If this is the one we have, this is a good one. The king of Israel's name appears no less than seven times in eight chapters. Because of what we know about his writing skills and his musical giftedness, this piece of scripture could have been penned at any point during Solomon's 40-year reign. The events mentioned in the song likely record just a little over one year of Old Testament history. We know this because the spring season is mentioned in chapter 2, and then it rolls around again in chapter 7. Both northern and southern cities of Israel are also mentioned in the poem. This points to a time before the kingdom was divided. If you guys remember some of what we went through in previous books, you guys know the nation of Israel was divided shortly after Solomon's reign ended. Since this book is one song written by one author, it needs to be viewed as a unified piece of poetic wisdom literature. It should not be seen as a series of love poems without a common theme or author, as some have thought. All 117 verses of Solomon's song have been recognized by the Jews as part of their sacred writings. It's included among the Old Testament books called the Five Scrolls, along with Ruth, Esther, Ecclesiastes, and Lamentations. The Jews actually read this song at Passover. Two other unique features of the book are the fact that God's name is never mentioned directly or explicitly, and the New Testament does not quote from the Song of Solomon. Now, like most scriptures that are somewhat difficult to understand, the Song of Solomon has suffered from many bizarre and strained interpretations over the centuries. It has often been seen as an allegory rather than being understood literally. If you remember, we were introduced to the allegorical method of interpretation during some past lessons on Bible versions. It was first popularized by an ancient Alexandrian heretic named Origen. Allegorical or spiritualized interpretations are those that seek to uncover some type of hidden mystical meaning that is believed to be present in the text. The words of scripture become an intricate code for unlocking the secret 
higher level of knowledge. Does this sound a little suspicious to anybody? I hope so, because it's actually just another form of Gnosticism, another kind of higher knowledge theology like universal church theory or Calvinism. Those that employ the allegorical method of interpretation claim that this song has no real historical basis. Instead, they believe it was written exclusively to depict God's love for Israel or Christ's love for the church. Unfortunately, this kind of faulty thinking has influenced many things. As one example, most of you are probably familiar with the hymn, The Lily of the Valley. We have sung it here at church before. The phrase, The Lily of the Valley, comes from chapter 2 and verse 1 of Song of Solomon. Taking the two phrases, the rose of Sharon, or the lily of the valley, and applying them to the Lord Jesus Christ is a result of the allegorical rather than the literal view of this book. Just another reason to make sure the way we're thinking is firmly grounded in a proper interpretation of scripture. Now, don't get me wrong here. There are definitely concepts presented in this book that share some similarities with other principles and ideas taught throughout the scripture. We know that certain aspects of the relationship between Christ and the institution of the church are compared to marriage in New Testament passages like Ephesians 5.32. What we need to avoid, however, is making everything we read in the Old Testament into a type or a foreshadow. When people start to spiritualize the scripture, it is easy to develop some very contradictory and unbiblical interpretations. This is why one of the first rules for any profitable Bible study is to carefully analyze every passage in its normal, literal, and historical context. If the Bible plainly identifies something as a type or a picture of Christ, then we have permission to view it this way. But we should be careful to let the Bible define these kinds of things for us. If what you're reading is not clear, then by default you should always approach the passage as a literal, historical event or teaching. The right way to understand Solomon's song is to take what it says at face value and interpret it in this literal and historical sense, realizing the frequent use of poetic imagery is being to used to depict reality. When we approach the book correctly, we can see that King Solomon is recounting his own memories of courtship and the early days of his first marriage. The Song of Solomon is expanding on the ancient instructions found in Genesis 2.24. Therefore shall a man leave his father and mother, and shall cleave unto his wife, and they shall be one flesh. This book is given by God to demonstrate his intention for the romance and the loveliness of marriage, which is the most precious of all human relationships. Apart from the title, the song is written entirely in poetic verse. It is classic Hebrew love poetry. The lines are short and rhythmic, and the language is filled with very dramatic images. It deals more with feelings than with objective doctrinal facts. The song is an enthusiastic expression of love. It is an outpouring of the words and feelings of two people experiencing human love with all of its joys, pains, and emotions. It's a book for those who want to know or remember how God has honored the love that should exist between a husband and a wife. Two main characters appear in this true life dramatic love song. Solomon, whose kingship is mentioned five times, appears as the beloved, and an unidentified Shulamite maiden is introduced as his counterpart. Now, some have suggested that she is the daughter of Pharaoh that was mentioned back in 1 Kings chapter 3, or that she was possibly Abishag, the Shunammite who cared for King David. The song provides no solid evidence for either of these conclusions. Therefore, it seems most reasonable to believe that this woman that Solomon loved was a simple maiden from Shunem, whose family had possibly been employed by the king. Shunem was a city three miles north of Jezreel in Lower Galilee. She would have been Solomon's first wife before he began his sin of taking 699 other wives and 300 concubines into the royal palace. Besides Solomon and his wife, there are several other groups that feature more minor roles in this book. These include mentions of the daughters of Jerusalem, Solomon's friends, the Shulamites' brothers, and even the city watchmen. The setting of the story is also varied. It moves between rural and urban scenes. Certain parts of the poem are set in the hill country north of Jerusalem, where the Shulamite lived, and where Solomon spent time as a vine grower and shepherd. The city section includes the wedding and time afterward at Solomon's palace in Jerusalem. Now, one of the main reasons that the Song of Solomon has frequently been interpreted allegorically is because it contains many descriptions of physical intimacy in the context of a marriage relationship. Concerns over the unconcealed nature 
of the poem's expressions of love and sexuality have led many to disregard what the book is teaching in favor of less dramatic, but also far less helpful interpretations. This wrong-headed refusal to deal with the, what the song is actually written about has created much harm because it hinders the possibility of making proper application in the areas of godly love and marital int intimacy. There are at least three reasons that all believers need to deal with the Song of Solomon honestly. Number one, as the Bible is meant to serve guide for every aspect of life, so the song deals with the universal reality of love and the physical part of a marriage relationship. Christians need direction and teaching about how to nurture love for a spouse just as they need guidance in every other matter. People are frequently saved out of all manner of sin and perversion. Speaking from personal experience, many need to have their entire concept of physical affection completely cleared out and rebuilt after godly principles and healthy patterns. The song teaches that the love relationship that is shared between a man and wife is meant to touch every area of their lives. It should be spiritual, emotional, verbal, and physical. Again and again, the two main characters speak of their desire for and joy that is found in each other. For many couples, the inability to express love verbally is a profound problem. We will discuss this more at the end of the message. Second, although the song teaches by example and not through commandment, its message is still crystal clear. The love that this couple shared was exclusive and it was binding. Chapter 7 and verse 10 says, I am my beloved's and his desire is toward me. By implication, God's ideal portrait of marriage excludes all extramarital relations as well as any perversions or abuses such as promiscuity or homosexuality. Finally, Song of Songs celebrates godly love between man and woman as something that is valid and beautiful even in a terribly fallen and sinful world. The joys of love found in marriage are an incredible blessing and they are a happy escape for many of life's trials and difficulties. This part of the marriage relationship is never something that believers should be ashamed of, anxious about, or hesitant to address. The example portrayed by Song of Songs testifies first and foremost to the amazing grace and provision of God. He is the one who heals our sin-damaged minds and our broken relationships. Though we are all sinners, God shows us that the love relationship between a man and wife is a thing to be greatly cherished and enjoyed. If the Bible said nothing in this area, Beyond prohibitions and warnings, we might mistakenly think that all sexuality is innately evil and is to be suppressed, and some have indeed taken this unbiblical position throughout the years. Because of the song in the Bible, we understand that it is not sexuality itself, but the misuse and abuse of it that is wrong and sinful. In the song, we see that the genuine love between man and woman and the physical affection that follows is a good and a tender thing. It is a blessing, not an embarrassment. How we treat this subject will have a massive impact on not only our marriages, but also on those that follow after us. Our kids need to know about the beauty and wonder of God's design for marriage. They need to know that your relationship with your husband or wife is an amazing and an honorable thing, both from your lips and from your example in the home. When it comes to teaching our children about all of the physical realities of married life, parents carry the serious responsibility of making absolutely sure their kids hear it from them, that they learn about God's plan for marriage from his word, not from anyone else, and certainly not from the world. I can say honestly from my own experience that when parents are negligent in this area, the kids will find out about it on their own, whether from a friend or a book or a video, or in my case, from a magazine I found in a parking lot at the age of nine. I still remember the exact place. I still remember what I saw. It's been 24 years, and I can still remember that day like it was yesterday. When parents fail to discuss these things in an appropriate way with their kids, they're setting them up for untold misery and swift destruction at the hands of the world. If we don't create an environment in our homes where these kinds of things can be topics of healthy discussion, then where on earth can they be talked about? I want my kids to know, anytime they are damaged by this world, whether by scraping their knee on a rock or by seeing something they shouldn't, they can and should run to their mother and I. They need to know that their mom and dad will have the answers. The mom and dad will guard them, and the mom and dad will be setting an example of a godly marriage for them to follow. Friends, this issue is so serious. 
we have a determined enemy. As parents, we all need to realize the dire consequences of failing to train up our kids in the way that they should go. The model of marriage portrayed in Song of Solomon should be used in this process of training and discipleship. In contrast to the world's distorted extremes of ascetic abstinence or lustful perversion outside of marriage, Solomon's ancient love song exalts the purity of marital affection and romance. It parallels and enhances other portions of scripture which portray God's plans for marriage, including the beauty and sanctity of intimacy between husband and wife. The song rightly stands alongside other classic passages which expand on this theme. Hebrews 13.4 captures the heart of the message. Marriage is honorable in all, and the bed undefiled, but warmongers and adulterers God will judge. The Song of Songs is also useful to us because the book provides a realistic portrayal of human relationship. The author knew how hard it can be to wait for marriage. He knew about all of the insecurities, the second guessing, and the doubts. He knew about the miscommunications and the awkwardness. He knew about the longing, the dreams, the meddling relatives and friends, and the struggle that will always occur when a couple attempts to establish a good relationship. He understood that humans no longer live in the Garden of Eden, but in a fallen world where love, too, has its pain. There is great encouragement present here. The overwhelming impression the book leaves with its reader is that love is a beautiful and joyous thing in which one might find deep satisfaction and contentment. The shepherd is portrayed as an honorable and loving man, and the song shows us a world where he and a beautiful country girl can be happy and fulfilled. Now let's look at some key chapters and verses. I'll mention two chapters to you, chapter 1 and chapter 4. We're not going to go there and read them this morning. Chapter 1 introduces the love and communion that exists between the bride and her bridegroom. Chapter 1. Chapter 4 contains beautiful imagery of the king declaring his love for his wife, with the last verse showing the Shulamite welcomes and returns his feelings. The description of their affection continues into chapter 5 and verse 1, which completes the picture. Chapter 1 and chapter 4. Some key verses are going to be chapter 6, verse 3, and chapter 7, verse 10. 6, verse 3 says, I am my beloved's, and my beloved is mine. He feedeth among the lilies. In chapter 7, 10, we read already, I am my beloved's, and his desire is toward me. The key word in the Song of Solomon is beloved. It's found 23 times. A key idea here is close fellowship. The love and the passion displayed between the king and his Shulamite is a litmus test for the level of importance we should be placing on our fellowship with God. Luke 14, 26 puts their example into perspective. If any man come to me and hate not his father and mother and wife and children and brethren and sisters, yea, in his own life also, he cannot be my disciple. For all of the powerful affections displayed in this book, Solomon helps us to better appreciate the depth of love God has for us, expressed in the sacrifice, sacrificial price paid by his son. Anything less than the daily walk of close fellowship and relationship falls far short of his plan. Failing to return God's love is sin, and allowing our times, times of fellowship with him to become infrequent and meaningless is an insult to the cross. We must pursue Christ above all things, lest it be asked of us, how shall we escape if we neglect so great salvation? Now, how do we see Christ in the Song of Solomon? Well, as I already mentioned, there has been a long tradition of applying this book to the Lord Jesus Christ by drawing analogies between the experiences of the two lovers and the experience of Christ and his church institution. Many that have sought to spiritualize the plain teachings of Song of Solomon have simply gone too far making connections that do not exist. But there is no need to become unbalanced in either direction. We can view Song of Solomon as a literal historic record and make application from it while also appreciating that some of the principles taught in its pages are expanded upon in other scriptures. There are similarities between the marriage covenant and God's relationship with his people because they are both binding, lifelong commitments of total faithfulness. When the Bible makes connections between the Lord and his people and compares them to the relationship between man and wife, this is always to illustrate the unbreakable nature of a right relationship with God 
and the need that we have to be faithful to him in all things. The image of God as a husband and his covenant people as a wife appears in the Old Testament for this purpose. Hosea 2, 18 through 20 builds the connection between God and the nation of Israel on the basis of righteousness, judgment, loving kindness, mercies, and faithfulness. This passage says, And in that day I will make a covenant for them with the beasts of the field and with the fowls of heaven and with the creeping things of the ground, and I will break the bow and the sword and the battle out of the earth, and I will make them to lie down safely. And I will betroth thee unto me forever. Yea, I will betroth thee unto me in righteousness and in judgment and in loving kindness and in mercies. I will even betroth thee unto me in faithfulness, and thou shalt know the Lord. Jeremiah 2, 2 again describes a marriage-like connection between God and his people on the basis of faithfulness. It says, Go and cry in the ears of Jerusalem, saying, Thus saith the Lord, I remember thee, the kindness of thy youth, the love of thine espousals, when thou wentest after me in the wilderness, in the land that was not sown. This is the same relationship we see appearing in passages like Ephesians 5, 22 and 23. The care exhibited by Christ in loving and caring for his people is meant to be copied by the husband in relation to his wife. Again, the concept of faithfulness and spiritual fidelity is at the forefront. I believe that this is the primary reason why the Bible forbids all divorce and teaches that remarriage after a divorce is a sinful act of adultery. Such actions pervert and distort the picture of faithfulness that God is communicating with his word. God does not jump from person to person making and then breaking his commitments. We either have a right relationship with him exclusively or we don't have one at all. The biblical model is best illustrated in the context of a godly marriage. It is perfectly appropriate to recognize that there will be some similarities between the love and commitment shared between a husband and a wife and God and his people. The two are meant to complement one another. After all, you can't have a godly marriage without first having a committed relationship to God. Appreciating the imagery that we find in the Song of Solomon does not require us to squeeze every picture and description for some hidden meaning. Not all of them even apply to the Lord's relationship with us. There are still significant differences between a marriage relationship and the connection between Christ and his churches. Carelessness in this regard can eventually lead to perversions of scripture, and in some cases, sheer blasphemy as the lines between humans' relationship and God's fellowship with us become blurred. Like I said, some very strained interpretations of this book have arisen over the years. Despite the differences, there are at least three similarities we can take from the Song of Songs that are still perfectly appropriate. So I'll mention them here quickly. Number one, selflessness. Selflessness. Just as this is a necessary component of any godly marriage, selflessness is central to God's grace, his work on the cross, and his relationship with us. Selflessness. Two, honest desire. Honest desire. A godly marriage will not be half-hearted or ambivalent on the part of either person. God's desire for faithful and fruitful relationship with his people is not careless or grudging either. Consider the great love he has shown in showering us with the truth of his word, thereby protecting us from great spiritual danger. <clears throat> Selflessness, honest desire, and lastly, commitment. Commitment. As I already mentioned, faithfulness is the defining feature of all of God's interactions with his people. Even when we fail, he still holds true to his word. There will be many failures on both sides in a marriage. But even in this miserably imperfect world, we can remain faithful to our wives and our husbands. The Lord expects and requires it because we are to be holding forth his faithfulness with the example of our lives. All right, we'll change gears a little bit. Uh, turn back to chapter 6 if you guys are still at chapter 8. We're going to finish up this message by making some good applications to take home. <laughs> now I'll be honest and tell you, this part of the study was pretty difficult this week. And a big part of me just wanted to skip it altogether. But 2 Timothy 3.16 says, All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. And you just can't get away from it. This book is inspired scripture. Therefore, we have a responsibility to approach it as such. We need to respect it, even when it's challenging. I titled this portion of the study, How to Love and Also Like 
your spouse. So it's primarily directed to those here that are married. But lest people that are not joined in matrimony start to think that they're exempt from listening, the biblical principles I draw your attention to today are applicable to many circumstances. They will play out with the most significance in marriage, but they are relevant to some other relationships as well. Have you guys ever noticed that the weird disconnect that exists in our culture when it comes to the institution of marriage? On the one hand, everyone wants a very pleasant and stable relationship, but on the flip side, an objectively excellent marriage is viewed by the world as boring, stuffy, and prudish. Countless books, movies, and TV shows have been created with the single-minded purpose of ripping the ideals of marriage apart. At worst, these productions try to completely redefine the institution, but at the very least, they exploit common relational failings and drama for a cheap laugh. The TV show Married with Children is a great example of what I'm talking about. It was the longest lasting live action sitcom on Fox running for 10 years and 259 episodes. And the entire premise of the show revolved around the total misery of Al and Peggy Bundy's awful marriage. I'm not endorsing this show. It's absolutely filthy. Don't ever watch it. But it is a good example of people's strange obsession with terrible marriages versus their desire to have a happy one themselves. Now, obviously, having a good, godly marriage depends on a wide variety of factors, both spiritual and practical. We don't have the space to cover all of them this morning. But I do want to use the rest of our time together to give you an important reminder about some different areas of interest in a good marriage. These principles are basic, but they are the trouble spots where many marriages fall short and may even begin to crumble. There are three points that I want to highlight in verses 10, excuse me, verses 4 through 10 of chapter 6. Point number one really is scattered all throughout chapter 6, but I'm going to draw your attention to verses 4, 6, 7, and 10. And I'll read them in that order. Thou art beautiful, O my love, as Tirzah. Comely is Jerusalem, terrible is an army with banners. Thy teeth are as a flock of sheep which go up from the washing, whereof every one beareth twins, and there is not one barren among them. As a piece of a pomegranate are thy temples within thy locks. Who is she, verse 10, that looketh forth as the morning, fair as the moon, clear as the sun, and terrible as an army with banners? The quality of any marriage, or really any other human relationship, will depend upon your answer to this simple question, which is my first point. How do you speak to one another? How do you speak to one another? Proverbs 18.21 says, Death and life are in the power of the tongue, and they that love it shall eat the fruit thereof. Read through the Song of Solomon sometime and put your finger on every compliment that you come to. You will be overwhelmed almost immediately by the flood of sweet names, caring phrases, and admirable descriptions. The song is not merely the evidence of a passing passion or the naive romance of young love. It is God's clear expectation that those taking part in a marriage would continue to build one another up for their entire lives. Just look at the ways that Solomon describes his Shulamite bride in these four verses. Verse 4 says, Thou art beautiful, O my love, as Tirzah, comely as Jerusalem, terrible as an army with banners. He first addresses her as my love. Love is to be his lady's special name throughout the book. She reciprocates by naming him as her beloved exclusively and repeatedly. Do you have a special name for your wife or husband? Do you compliment each other regularly? No believer can hide behind the excuse, well, our relationship just isn't like that. Why isn't it like that? What changes need to be made in other key areas to bring it into line with this wonderful and biblical example of a loving marriage? Next, Solomon tells his bride that she is as beautiful as Tirzah. Tirzah was a northern capital under King Omri. It was known for its great natural beauty and extensive gardens. It also had an abundant supply of water that made its flowers and trees possible. Solomon is complimenting his lovely lady on her natural beauty. Young men, take careful note. It is your job to affirm and compliment your future wife repeatedly and tenderly. Just be sure you're married to her before you make it a habit. Solomon also tells the Shulamite that she is as comely as Jerusalem. Comely means lovely. Psalm 48, 1 through 2 says of Israel's capital, Great is the Lord, and greatly to be praised in the city of our God, in the mountain of his holiness. 
beautiful for situation, the joy of the whole earth is Mount Zion on the sides of the north, the city of the great king. There is still great beauty in the city of Jerusalem. Even today, in spite of the ruins, turmoil, and tension, it is still one of the prettiest spots in the world. The last phrase, terrible as an army with banners, might sound a little insulting to our modern Western ears, but it's actually a wonderful compliment. Solomon is telling his wife that she is splendid or awe-inspiring to look upon. I wonder what most ladies here would do if their husbands told them they were as inspiring as an army of banners, especially considering our military families. If your wife thinks that you've lost your mind, you probably need to say it to her more often. Verse 6 appears next under this section. Thy teeth are as a flock of sheep which go up from the washing, whereof every one beareth twins, and there is not one barren among them. Here Solomon waxes eloquent on the magnificence and beauty of his bride's smile. He notices every small detail. Her teeth are clean and white, like a flock of sheep coming from the washing. The picture here is of clean animals, freshly shorn and energetic. Every one beareth twins means that all of her teeth were in perfect proportion to one another. There is not one barren among them means that none of them are missing. Lest you think Solomon's descriptions of his bride are unnecessary or over the top, think again. At least he knows her well enough to describe the little details of her appearance. Men, ladies, do you pay close enough attention to your spouse? This will be reflected in what you say or do not say about them. Verse 7 says, As a piece of pomegranate are thy temples within thy locks. Solomon has commented on the beauty of his bride's eyes, hair, and teeth throughout the song. Now he mentions her temples. The face of his bride would have been veiled prior to their wedding night. It's possible he held her face in his hands prior to actually seeing her, and now he describes how that felt. He has already spoken these same words to her in chapter 4 and verse 3. Comparing her to a piece of pomegranate would mean that her cheeks are healthy and radiant. A pomegranate looks a bit like an orange on the outside, but when it's sliced, the inside appears a rich red. Perhaps this is also in reference to her modest blush on their wedding day. Notice that there is nothing forward, brash, or tomboyish about Solomon's bride. She was not a manly woman in any way. She was a lady of beauty, modesty, and virtue, and her graceful femininity delighted her husband. The final verse that falls under this point is 10. Who is she that looketh forth as the morning, fair as the moon, clear as the sun, and terrible as an army with banners? This question reveals the power of a bride's attractiveness upon her husband. One of the defining features of this book is the fidelity and the loyalty displayed between the characters of husband and wife. In chapter 2 and verses 2 through 3, it says, As the lily among thorns, so is my love among the daughters. As the apple tree among the trees of the wood, so is my beloved among the sons. May we all view our own wives and husbands exactly like these folks did. Solomon's wife is said to be as bright as a full moon and as clear or bright as the sun. That means she was very beautiful and full of vitality and life. She is again said to be as awesome as an army with banners. Solomon's love was truly magnificent and captivating for him to look upon. Everyone needs to take note of the power of speech that is revealed to us in these verses. Speaking to your spouse in a loving and gracious manner is not about rattling off some careless compliment or about doing something out of dry obligation. It's about having a healthy heart connection that results in this kind of speech. It should be completely natural for partners in a godly marriage to desire to build one another up. So I'll ask you the question again, how do you speak to one another? What are you teaching your kids with your example? Our next two points will be a bit shorter than the first one. Take a look at verse 5. It says, Turn away thine eyes from me, for they have overcome me. Thy hair is as a flock of goats that appear from Gilead. My next question in this point relates to the appearance or the importance of appropriate body language. It's not enough to merely say the right thing. The rest of you needs to be sending the same message. Number two is how do you look at each other? How do you speak to one another? How do you look at each other? Matthew 6.22 says, The light of the body is the eye. If therefore thine eye be single, thy whole body shall be full of light. The way that we look at one another communicates a great deal. Turn away thine eyes from me, for they have overcome me. means that this woman stirred Solomon's emotions just by looking at him. And when a husband has love in his heart for his wife, this is just what one look of the eyes can do. We're not talking about worldly or shallow seduction. 
The eyes communicate genuine love and admiration as easily as they convey anger and contempt. So be very careful about how you look at your spouse or anyone that you love. What a contrast here in verse 5 to just giving them a blank stare or the look like they want to kill you expression common in our day. How you look at your wife or husband is just as important as what you say to them. And all of us need the frequent reminder, look at each other with love and admiration. Our third and final point comes to us from chapter 6 and verses 8 and 9. There are three score queens and four score concubines and virgins without number. My dove, my undefiled, is but one. She is the only one of her mother. She is the choice one of her that bear her. The daughters saw her and blessed her. Yea, the queens and the concubines, they praised her. And so our last question is this. How do you regard each other? How do you speak to each other? How do you look at each other? How do you regard each other? Respect, love, and faithfulness are communicated through our words, our expressions, and our actions. An attitude of disrespect or contempt is displayed in exactly the same way. Both participants in a marriage must guard their hearts against holding their spouse in low esteem. We have to make the choice to respect them even when they fail to please us in some way. In verse 8, Solomon is seen praising his bride for her prominence above all other women. The text does not say that Solomon had these women at this time. The text does not say, I have. It says, there are. He is saying there may be 60 queens, 80 concubines, and even countless unmarried and pure women in the world, but there is none like you. This is powerful evidence for his level of respect and admiration for her. There may very well have been another more capable or more objectively beautiful woman in the group he mentioned, but genuine love values the object that is loved above any other. It respects and elevates the person that is loved. Another game name given to Solomon's bride is my dove, my undefiled. The dove is known for its faithfulness, devotion, softness, and gentle spirit. Undefiled means perfect or upright. Solomon's bride had no impurity, and he respects and esteems her chaste character very highly. Solomon's praise for the Shulamite continues in regard to her place in the heart of her mother. He says she is the choice one of her that bear her. Solomon is not the only one who views her as special and beautiful. And this is amazing. A husband and his mother-in-law can't agree on something. Solomon refers to the praise of other people when he says, The daughters saw her and blessed her. Yea, the queens and the concubines, they praised her. The word blessed carries the idea of a happy congratulations. When the women of the court saw Solomon's bride and the look she had on her face along with the love in her heart, they knew she was blessed and should be congratulated. They praised her. The word praised is our English word, hallelujah. The court women knew Solomon, could have any woman in the world he wanted, but he chose the special Shulamite lady. They praised her because Solomon praised her first. How many poor married ladies go through their life never having such wonderful things said about them? What a tragic thing. The pattern found in these verses is instructive for every one of us. Solomon begins and ends his statements by talking about how beautiful his bride is. The first and last words out of his mouth are all about her beauty. If you're a husband at this point, you might be tempted to say something like, words are cheap. And if you're a wife, you might be thinking, he's just saying all this nice sounding stuff because he wants something. But there is so much more going on here than that. If you are a man sitting here this morning, and I'm speaking to myself too, you need to understand that your words are anything but cheap. In actuality, they are just about the most expensive thing a husband can give to his wife. Your words can transform her into a graceful, confident, and joyous light for your home. Or they can reduce her into an anxious, fearful, and distant presence in your house. Men, if you discover that something is not right in your relationship, even during the study this morning, then you better begin by pointing the finger straight at yourself. Solomon gives, and he keeps on giving his wife, words of affirmation and praise. It doesn't necessarily come naturally to him, but he does it anyway. He honors her above all other women, and he's not afraid to declare his love for her publicly. He understands that his wife will always desperately need to feel wanted, loved, and attractive. So he acts selflessly, and he doesn't get distracted from what he should be saying to her. I'm sure all of us want to experience an overpowering relationship of love with our spouse. 
Unfortunately, sometimes we just don't know where to begin. It doesn't have to be complicated. Why not make a commitment to start where Solomon started, with your words, your expressions, and your respect? Verse 5 reminds us that it is not always easy to look into the eyes of the one we love while we say what we need to say. (laughs) So if you must, ask your wife or husband to look away for a moment so you won't be embarrassed. Do whatever you need to do, but tell your beautiful wife or your diligent husband how much you love them and what they mean to you. And if you're not married, find a sibling, friend, child, or church member and say something nice to them too. When you make this a priority, the love that you are looking for will start to flourish and blossom. Let's pray.